This is the 10 Minute Contrarian Podcast. This is VP. We are a solutions based podcast, diving into the world of contrarian investing and alternative finance. You can find us hosted on the No Nonsense Forex YouTube channel, nonsenseforex.com, and podcast players everywhere. Episode 21 is brought to you by the No Nonsense Forex Discord Forum. That's right. I know most of you know about this, but do all of you know about this? This is a place where followers of my YouTube channel and my podcast get together as a group of like-minded individuals and become better and better at trading and investing. Now, just as is the case on my YouTube channel, most of the activity is concentrated in the Forex trading subforums. But we do have subforums as well for general buy and hold investments, crypto, metals trading, ETFs, and individual stocks. All things we talk about here on the podcast. So if you ever feel like you need some help and I will not answer your question, this is the perfect place to go. How often do you get to hang around and bounce ideas off of like-minded people? Uh, for some people, that's never. Uh, so I will put a link down below in the show notes. It is going to be my FAQ page on nononsenseforex.com. Click it. And then I think the third hyperlink down is the link you need to click on to gain access to the forum. And when you're there, please behave yourself. The moderators do not play around. It is the 10-Minute Contrarian Podcast, and uh, catching a bit of a cold right now. You might hear it in my voice, but the show must go on, because we have something very important to talk about this week. And this is something I would have talked about probably 10 episodes ago, but there just weren't a lot of really good choices open to the public with this. It's that new. And as you may have guessed from the title, it is Carbon Credits. This was first brought to my attention by Marin Katusa, who we have mentioned many times on this show. And full disclosure, I am a paid subscriber to his newsletter. For what it's worth, it's very expensive, but it is very worth it at the same time. Not only for the exclusive research or the overall stock picks, uh, but the guidance going forward, you know, once you're already in those stocks. You know, we know here, money management's everything. And you're getting the best of all of it with this newsletter. Now, somebody did ask me this question before. You know, if I have X amount of money, should I be paying this much for newsletters? And the answer is no. You know, for example, don't sit there and spend 10, 15% of your entire bankroll on information. Um, because a lot of really great information is absolutely free or significantly cheaper. And you can go to katusaresearch.com and it is all free. Uh, now, for what it's worth, it's always really weird for me on this podcast because I don't want to mention any stocks or ETFs that I hold that were given to me by a paid newsletter because that is a huge dick move. Um, but a lot of times you'll see these people on Twitter talking about a stock that they recommended months ago. You know, or in the case of Don Durrett, who I mentioned last week, sometimes he'll take excerpts of his database and put them up on Twitter for all to see. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. You know, if you want to pay to get in early, then that's what you do. And then afterwards, they'll promote it online. You know, it's not a pump. Pump ensues that there's going to be a dump coming after it. You know, promoting a stock that your subscribers had already gotten into early is completely fine for me. You know, I got no problem with it. I'm frankly glad it happens. Uh, but sometimes I never quite know what has been made public and what hasn't. Is the reason why you don't often hear me talk about my own portfolio. About half of it came from paid newsletters. So yes, I have been in this market for a little while, and it was because of my paid subscription. And no, I was not going to go immediately blab about it to thousands of podcast listeners, um, even though I do love you all, and I would have liked to have done that. Uh, but we are here now, and there are a lot more options for you now, and that is a good thing. And we will talk about those soon. But first, what on earth is a carbon credit? Well, the answer is not that simple. I will give you the simple version. And if you want to know more, Marin Katusa has also done a PDF that goes over everything and really explains really, really well just how large this thing is going to scale going forward. I will leave that link down below in the show notes as well. Uh, it is a PDF, so whatever device you're on, make sure you have a PDF viewer. Uh, but you are certainly going to want to look at it. It is going to get you so hyped for this that it is not going to matter at all that you came in a bit later. Because uh, I don't even really think we're late. So this is a play for the next 20, 30 years, if you want it to be. But we are just now hearing about it on places like CNBC and Bloomberg. Uh, and I looked at all the vehicles that are out there for people to purchase. There hasn't been a ton of money put into these things yet. So don't think you're late. It's almost like if you would have gotten into Bitcoin at $50, 
as opposed to $25. Now, sure, you would have had twice as many, but who cares? You're still swimming in money. And there could always be pullbacks, though to date there has not really been one. So just take that for what it's worth. And Marin said it himself. He's like, on my entire career, and this guy's early to just about everything, by the way. He said his entire career, he never thought he had a tiger by the tail more than he does right now with these carbon credits. Uh, and I'll explain one of the reasons why that is in a moment. Um, but anyway, in a nutshell, you know, there's two main kinds, but the, the easiest one to digest is the ones that are set by governments. Governments say, okay, companies, you can only use this many carbon emissions maximum. And if you go over that, in order to offset the amount you just went over, you have to purchase a carbon credit. And that credit will go to, you know, planting trees or saving trees or preserving water resources, something that is a net positive for the environment for the damage you have caused by going over your limit. And this is just going to be the way things are for the next few decades. Why? Because governments all over the world have already mandated it. It's just like my copper video. You know, the reason I'm so bullish on copper is not only do we need it for everything we have and everything we're going to have, but governments have already said, not only said, they have mandated that we will need to be electrified as a planet by a certain time, and you will need copious amounts of copper to do so. It's a total layup. They've already told us what they're going to do. Now, if governments say things, that's one thing, but if they actually put forward the money and make the mandate, you know, which they have done, you know, then that's a whole different story altogether. Now, if you don't like these ESG mandates, and especially the way they have been, I guess, bullied into the financial system, uh, then I don't blame you for that. As I've said before, I love the environment, but the way they have gone about this has been completely wrong, and we will pay for it. You know, this is why I'm in dirty fossil fuel stocks as well. But those stocks and carbon credits can both go up at the same time, and I believe they will. You know, when it comes to making money, it does not pay to be tribal. If there are opportunities abound, and there is good reason behind them, well, then you take advantage. And that's what I have done. Even though none of this is official investment advice, don't do anything I say. Entertainment purposes only. You know the deal. But let's go ahead and use that to segue into the solutions part of this episode. Now, once again, our good old friend ETFs are here to help us out. Um, there are individual stocks. Um, I will list one or two of them down below. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, in North America, there are about six or seven ETFs. Here's the thing, though. As always, you must do your research and find out what these ETFs hold. Because you will find the majority of them hold things like Amazon and Facebook and J.P. Morgan for some reason. Um, NVIDIA. Google. Now, you might be saying, those are not carbon credit companies, and you're right, they're not. These ESG-based ETFs often have some of the goofiest holdings inside of them, but the thing is, a lot of individual investors and even fund managers will only look at the title and some of the overall metrics. They won't even look and see what's inside. Now, so in the end, it may not matter, but I personally don't have any interest in holding an ETF that has those companies in it because there's like hundreds of ETFs that have those companies in it. You know, why is this one special? Um, and the same goes for ESG ETFs all over the board. You're going to see a lot of them have companies like Exxon in them, the largest oil company in North America. <laughs> and you're like, what? <laughs> you know, Exxon actually has made a turn and gone a lot more green because they saw the writing on the wall. You know, but it's typically not what you would think about when you're trying to invest in green technology. Or if you're a total hippie and you hate oil companies, you might end up investing in these things by mistake. When it comes to ETFs, always look and see what is inside. And then determine if it's right for you. Um, so all of those ETFs and the one or two stocks that we have too are going to be listed down below in the show notes for North America. I have taken these directly from a tweet that CarbonCredits.com sent out. Um, you should probably follow them on Twitter along with Marin Katusa and along with VP. Um, but I will put that list down below along with, yes, I got your back too, non-North Americans, uh, one ETF from the Aussie exchange and one from the European exchange. And as always, there may be more that I have not listed. If you can find some, put that down below in the comments section of this episode on YouTube. 
help the community out. Now, please do not mistake ESG ETFs for carbon credit ETFs. Now, there are about 17 million ESG ETFs, where there's only a handful of actual carbon credit ETFs out there right now. Uh, but as always, I am just your gateway to all of these wonderful opportunities. And this is a good one, man. I am probably more bullish on this than I would be even copper, because the one thing that can really set copper back, especially in the short term, maybe the midterm, is, as I've said in the past, if we have a large economic downturn and we just flat out stop building to where that particular drawback does not apply to the carbon credits market. It's still very new. Anything can happen. But what we do know is it is going to happen. Whether you think it's unfortunate or not, very powerful people and governments from all over the world have come together on this one. And even if it goes awry, what do governments do? Do they come out and admit their mistake and say, my bad, we ruined the economy? We're going to start doing things the complete opposite now? Of course not. They double down. They triple down. So rest assured, if this thing is going to end up being a huge success or a gigantic circus, it doesn't matter because it is still happening and will continue to happen for what is likely a very long time. You know, this concept is brand new to a lot of people, but it is probably going to be the new normal. So if people think you're crazy for investing in these things or even talking about these things, you just tell them that you are not crazy. You're just early.